Now, why do we use woodworking machinery? Well, you might say to get things done more easily and quickly. But I have a better answer. I would suggest that it's to get from this to this, a perfect workpiece, and do this every time for as long as is necessary. Now, our task in this video is to show how, in the hands of a good craftsman, woodworking machinery can produce excellent results every time, safely and quickly. In this video, I'm going to show you how some of the most frequently used woodworking machines can be operated safely and efficiently. We shall be seeing the radial arm saw, the tilt arbor saw bench, the planar thicknesser, the band saw, the mortising machine, the tenoning machine, and the spindle moulder function on a universal woodworker. I must stress that safe wood machining depends on the attitude of the operator, be he amateur or professional. Now, first of all, a few points that should be constantly borne in mind. First of all, wear sensible clothing, nothing loose or dangly. If you've got long hair, be careful about that, of course, this doesn't bother me. Keep your workplace tidy, stack materials safely, and avoid wearing any jewellery or watches. Have a decent lighting situation and reasonable working temperature. Now, accidents seldom just happen. They're caused by human error. They can be prevented by constant attention to safe working practices. Right, now let's go to our first machine. Now, the radial arm saw is a versatile machine that can be adapted to perform many tasks. Now, I'm going to show it doing the jobs for which I think it is best suited, namely cross-cutting operations. Now, I'll look at the machine generally. But first of all, an important thing. Always isolate before you handle any machine. Generally, it consists of a motor carrying a saw blade on an arm. The arm can be angled, or the motor head can be tilted. The type of blade is important. This particular one is a 96 tooth tungsten carbide tip blade. Most people prefer this type of blade. Blades with excessive hook should be avoided as they tend to grab and are therefore dangerous. There is a limitation on the size of the smallest blade that can be used on the radial arm saw and this should be clearly displayed on the machine. The drawing shows how the rule is applied. Now the radial arm saw can be most usefully employed cross-cutting. For handling long lengths of material, extension tables are necessary. And for repetition work, a stop, which can be cramped to the back fence, is useful. Right now, let's have a look at some jobs we can do with the radial arm saw. First, squaring off. The material is held with the right hand and the saw is pulled with the left hand. Right, now one or two important points. Pull the saw smoothly and cut without jerking. Return it right back to its stop. Now some saws take a considerable time to run down. Never attempt to stop a saw with a piece of wood or anything similar to that. And an important point, always cut with the saw under full power. Never when it's running down. Right, now let's cut off to length. When cutting material off to length, a suitable stop should be fitted. The material is held with the left hand and the saw pulled with the right hand. When small pieces are required, a suitable stick should be used to hold them.
angle cuts can be formed by rotating the radial arm as we have seen. But to avoid cutting through the fence in several places, I prefer to use this angle cutting jig. This can be rotated to any desired angle and locked in position. And for repetition work, a suitable stop is provided, which again can be locked in place. So when cutting plastics or similar thin sheet material, this hold down device is useful for keeping the workpiece flat. For carrying out such jobs as cross grain trenching, the dado head is a very useful tool. This particular one has a pair of blades and the width of the cut is adjustable by means of shims. Just a few points about the radial arm saw. In common with all other woodworking machinery, keep blades and cutters really sharp. Use dust extraction whenever possible. And also, by reference to the maker's handbook, keep the machine in correct adjustment. The tilting arbor saw bench is probably the most widely used saw in the woodworking industry today. Blade sizes range up to 500 millimetres in diameter. This particular machine has a tilting arbour, tilts the blade to 45 degrees, and a rise and fall mechanism. It also features a scoring saw, which counter rotates, and gives a chip and whisker free finish on plywood and melamine panels. There is a long fence, adjustable, that facilitates panel cutting, and a runoff table at the rear, which gives a stable support to long panels. It's also mandatory if a second party is taking off. Now it's most important, before removing or replacing any saw blade on a circular saw, that the machine be isolated. This is a typical tungsten carbide tip saw blade, suitable for general purpose work. Other blades are available with finer teeth for panel cutting. They would normally be used on this machine in conjunction with the scoring saw. Now there is a rule about the smallest side of blade that's permitted on any circular saw. And this size must be clearly indicated on the saw bench itself. The riving knife is important. It protects the back of the saw and prevents the cut material binding on the saw blade. The gap between the riving knife and the saw blade should be as close as possible, but no more than 12 millimetres. The thickness of the riving knife should be slightly thicker than the plate of the saw. The crown guard should always be kept in place unless a suitable approved alternative is used. When cutting, the distance between the cut material and the lower edge of the guard should not exceed 12 millimetres. Now I know that many people remove the crown guard and the riving knife and then cut through the material twice by turning it over to achieve the maximum depth of cut on a given saw. This is a highly dangerous practice and should not be attempted. It is in fact illegal in an industrial situation. Before we do any work, one piece of advice. On every saw bench, a suitable properly made push stick should always be to hand. Now we're going to make a rip cut. I shall set the fence, lock it, 
and set the fence in this direction to a distance of 50 millimetres between the end of the fence and the tip of the saw. A couple of points about ripping. Firstly, always keep the hands well clear of the running blade. And if you find that the material is running out of true, it's probably because your fence is out of alignment with the blade. So check and adjust as necessary. Now we're going to do some rebating and grooving. We are in fact going to make a small sill section. The saw has been preset to the correct angle and a suitable approved hold down unit fitted in place of the crown guard. Now, the saw blade and the hold down unit has to be reset to make the second cut. An important point when making this cut is to ensure that the waste piece falls on the outside of the saw blade. This avoids trapping the piece between the saw blade and the fence. Finally, we're going to form the drip groove in the sill. The saw will be reset and the guard repositioned. Now the required width of groove can be achieved in two ways, either by using an adjustable grooving saw or by making several passes with the saw set. When cutting sheet materials, the saw blade and the crown guard should be kept as low as possible for clean cutting and maximum safety. For melamine face chipboard, a scoring head is desirable. Now if the distance between the saw blade and the fence is less than 300 millimetres, a push stick should be used. Now the contra-rotating scoring saw ensures a chip-free finish. A practical solution to the problem of cutting large panels accurately and safely is a sliding table. Now we're going to deal with planing. There are three main types of planing machine available. The overhand planer, the thicknesser, or the combination machine, or planer thicknesser. For the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to use the latter. The machine is isolated, and I'll remove the bridge guard for clarity. There are two tables, an in-feed and an out-feed table. The depth of cut is the difference between the height of the two tables. The height of the outfeed table should be level with the cutting circle of the blade. The height of the infeed table is adjustable in this case by means of a lever. The cutter block may have two or three knives. They are set level with the outfeed table either with a special setting device or more normally with a straight edge. Accuracy is of importance. 
a rigid bridge guard should always be used when overhand planing. The correct setting is for no more than 10 millimetres gap between the lower edge of the guard and the timber. And the same applies to the vertical. Well, of course, the rear of the cutter block is also guarded. Now, planing by machine is a very similar principle to planing by hand. The material is faced and edged and then brought to finished width and thickness. First of all, the operation is surfacing. When machining short lengths of material, a suitable push block should be used. A couple of points when overhand planing. Always try to avoid passing the hand directly over the cutter block, especially when you're machining small pieces. Avoid also the trailing finger, as this is a very, very common cause of accidents. And now let's do some thicknessing. The arrangement for thicknesses varies from machine to machine, but the basic principle remains the same. The material passes under the anti-kickback fingers, through the feed mechanism and under the cutter block. The purpose of the anti-kickback fingers is to prevent thin pieces being ejected when a number of pieces of material are being passed through the machine. The dust extraction hood is placed in position and raise or lower the table to the thickness of the material required. I engage the feed system and go. Some machines have a rebating facility. Now it's absolutely necessary that a suitable hold down unit be fitted if this operation is to be carried out. The depth of the rebate is set by adjusting the in-feed table. And finally, as with all woodworking machines, the planer should be kept really sharp. The blades can be honed in a block with a fine oil stone. But when they get really blunt, they should be removed and reground. Now a typical bandsaw to be used in the average workshop will accept blades from 3 to 20 millimetres. Apart from its value as a machine for contour cutting, a bandsaw can be used for a variety of other jobs, as we shall see. Now, to function efficiently, a bandsaw must possess the following features. A means of tensioning the blade, a means of tracking so that the blade will run in the centre of the band wheel, an efficient guide system, both above and below the table, a blade guard, which can be raised or lowered to suit the thickness of the work being done, and a fence for straight cutting. 
Now before we start using the bandsaw, it's important that you know how to fit a blade properly. So this is the first thing we should do. Now, firstly, before fitting any blade on a bandsaw, always make sure the machine is isolated. I've already fitted the blade on the lower band wheel, and it passes up through the guide system and is fitted around the top wheel. The tension is then taken up, and the blade is then trapped. Next, I adjust both top and bottom guides if necessary and replace the guard. The machine is now ready to run. The first operation we should be doing will be deep cutting. The bandsaw is ideal for ripping. It's safe economical on power and economical on material too because of the width of the saw curve. Now the guide has been set to just clear the top of the workpiece. One or two points about bandsawing generally. It's important that sharp blades are always used. Blades are designated by their overall length, their width, the number of teeth per inch and their gauge. Coarse, wide blades are normally used for ripping and other heavy work. Now when cutting long lengths of material, always employ either an assistant or use a runoff table. Now let's do some tenoning. Tenons can be cut easily on the bandsaw. The fence determining the depth of the cut and the mitre slide holding the work square. The stop here determines the depth of the cut. Now I'm going to reset the machine and do the final cut. That's a straightforward, neatly cut tenon. Now we're going to put a fine blade in and do some circle cutting. I've reset the machine with a six millimetre blade and a circle cutting attachment. Uh, I put a centre line on here and I shall run into that line before I commence the circular cut. I'm now going to lower the circle cutting attachment onto the job, making sure that it's firmly indented into the wood block.
Now when contour cutting, it's important that both hands be kept either side of the line of cut and never in direct line with the blade. And now I'll show you a couple of useful jigs. Now this is a useful jig for cutting fillets or glue blocks. This job can also be done by tilting the bandsaw table, but I find my method easier. Wedges are used in large quantities in joinery production, and this is a useful gadget for cutting them. Finally, a few words about blade breakage. It may be caused by cutting with a blade too wide for the radius of the cut, or it may be caused by a blunt blade. If blade breakage occurs frequently, one should investigate the possibility of guides being misaligned, the blade being cracked, or possibly fatigue if the blade has been used for a long time. Now I'm going to introduce two specialist machines, the mortiser and the tenoner. Mortising is normally done first, so let's deal with the mortiser. Now mortising is a tedious and time-consuming operation by hand, but with this machine it can be carried out quickly and safely. Basically the machine is a cutting element of a steel box with a revolving auger. The vertical movement is by hand lever and a stop controls the depth of cut. The horizontal and transverse movements are controlled by hand wheel. The material is locked in position with an adjustable clamp. One of the advantages of machine mortising is that it's only necessary to gauge the first mortise. Any subsequent mortises, only the sight lines need be put in. Now to form a haunched mortise, the timber is repositioned and at the appropriate moment the haunching stop is brought into play. result is a perfectly clean mortise. Now one or two points on mortising, first an important safety point. 
Never brush the chips away from the wood. If the line is obscured with chips, blow it away. Don't brush it with the hand. It's not even a particularly good idea to use a brush as the hairs can get entangled in the augers. Second point, when you start your cut, take light cuts to start with and then gradually increase the depth. And thirdly, when through mortising, always reverse the timber and work from both sides. Now the mortise chisels are available in a variety of sizes to suit the particular width of mortise that you want to cut. For maintenance, the sharpening of the actual chisel section is carried out with a suitable reamer, which is held in a carpenter's brace. For maintaining a keen edge on the auger, a small ward file will touch up the wings and the flat cutting surfaces. Now an important thing when using this particular chisel is that the auger does not rub against the chisel. There must always be a clearance there between the bottom of the chisel and the revolving auger. Failing to observe this point may result in the chisel bursting. So it's important that you always have a clearance of your auger there. Now the alternative is slot mortising. The slot mortiser usually forms part of a universal woodworker. The bits are available in a range of sizes and it's advisable to have them professionally resharpened. Now tenons are used in large numbers in the woodworking industry, particularly in joinery. In the past this work has been carried out on large and expensive machines, but with the advent of the smaller tenoner, it's now become a viable proposition for the small workshop. This machine has two horizontally mounted cutter blocks, which are adjustable both vertically and horizontally. A sliding table, which will accommodate one or more pieces. Alternative cutter blocks can be fitted with scribing cutters, both on the top and the bottom block, and should it be desired to do this type of work, a suitable cutter block set can be fitted. Now the machine has been preset, so let's cut a tenon. Now you'll have noticed that a spelch block was fitted to avoid breakout at the end of the cut and a stop controlled the length of the tenon. Now with sharp cutters and the guards in place, this is an exceptionally safe machine to use. And finally, the universal woodworker. This machine will perform most of the functions that we've already seen. Planing and thicknessing, rip sawing, cross cutting, and slot mortising. The one function we haven't mentioned is the spindle moulder. Now spindle moulding is a wide ranging subject far beyond the scope of this video. I will however show you the basic principles. The machine consists of a flat table through which a vertical spindle is installed, usually 30 millimetres in diameter on most modern machines. 
There are rings to suit the varying sizes of cutter block employed and spacers to vary the height. There is a rise and fall mechanism and some form of spindle lock. In this case, a Tommy bar. The switch should have a mushroom shaped top for ease of cutoff. The fences are adjustable for depth of cut. One or both being micro adjustable. The machine must be guarded to a standard that will meet the requirements of the current regulations. Now if a machine is used for more than six hours per week in a commercial situation, dust extraction should be fitted. But it does make sense to have this facility anyway. If you have a machine with metal fences, it's always a good idea to fit timber sub-fences. They can be either ply, MDF or hardwood. They're useful for fixing face boards. Now let's set the machine up to tackle a simple job. But the first thing one must do is isolate. Now first we shall set the cutter block onto the spindle. I'm using a Whitehill block here. The spindle, having been locked with a Tommy bar, the cutter block can be placed on at a convenient working height. The cutter is then inserted at least 20 millimetres into the block and locked firmly. A balancing cutter is placed in the opposite slot and again locked firmly. The square is checked. And the cutter block is then removed and placed as near the bearing as possible. The rings are replaced. Before using any cutter block, always check the manufacturer's recommended running speed. In the case of this four inch block, it's 6,000 RPM. At 6,000 revolutions per minute, with a sharp cutter and only one cutter cutting, excellent results can be achieved. Now many spindles have T slots to fix accessories. If these slots are absent from your machine, an excellent substitute is a false table. to which accessories can be fitted. The cutter height is checked, the spindle locked off. That's okay. I always recommend the use of a false fence. It makes for safer working and gives you a better quality job altogether. The next job is to break through the false fence. We check that the block runs freely and doesn't impel the back of the fence. Switch the isolator on. Release our fence screws. Machine on. isolate using the isolator on the machine. The next thing we do is measure the depth of cut. Yes, that seems about right. Now, with the guard in position, 
we make a test cut. <laughs> Well, that appears to be satisfactory. If there are any alterations to be made, now is the time to make them. Some people find the business of breaking through a little unnerving, but it's a practice well worth mastering. It's also a good idea to have a set starting drill. My cockpit drill is, check cutters are secure, check fences are locked, check rise and fall handles are locked, check block runs freely, guards in position and secure. All this takes only a few seconds and it is essential. One of the commonest jobs with the spindle moulder is the machining of straight lengths of material. Where fairly large sections are involved, the maker's guards are adequate. <laughs> This is just an introduction to spindle moulding and I recommend that the beginner proceeds with caution. Read any books on the subject and possibly seek advice from an experienced worker. I've made a video on basic spindle moulding which goes into the subject in some detail. Just remember at all time keep your guards in place and your cutters sharp. Now all woodworking machinery is to a certain extent both noisy and dusty and it does make sense to minimise both forms of pollution. Dust extraction is mandatory in industrial situations and there are a number of units available. As far as noise is concerned, this can be tackled at source by encasing certain machines but manufacturer's advice should be sought. Ear defenders should be worn when the noise level exceeds the prescribed limit and safety specs are always a good idea. Finally, I feel I can offer you no better advice than to remember the old motto, safety first. Mm -hmm.